So, um, hey, what's bugging the, the hell out of you? What's what's working and what's not working? Everything's working. So we yeah, okay. Then we'll. Yeah. Uh, we'll no, sorry. I you know I I think we can all agree that there's a line in that sand, and that line is 2020. And that before 2020, there wasn't even the acknowledgement that there was a problem. We we're all sort of going to market and saying, hey, Houston, there's a problem. And they said, no, there's not, we're digitizing. And, and that word is so all encompassing that it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to all people. But in March of 2020, most financial institutions that we were talking to were placing orders for laptops. One multinational one ran out of B2B suppliers and was calling Costco. That's a true story. That's not just an hyperbole. So I think what's working is that there's an acknowledgement that there's a real, we're at a real turning point here, an inflection point. And if banks and credit unions are going to be serving customers, they're going to have to make some changes quickly. So they're deciding now whether they're gonna build or buy, and then they're deciding why they should buy you in real time. Whereas last year, they were just kicking tires and deciding if there was a problem. Well, that's the working part, right? That's, yeah. it, it's good, you know, the pandemic kicked their ass and it's good for you selling them technology. Yeah. But there's gotta be a, another side of this coin, stuff that's that's not working. What, I mean, there's gotta be stuff that's there bugging is. you. So what are those there things? Is. And And, and you guys would kick my butt if I didn't just say it truthfully, because that's what this forum is for. I would say what's not working is that while they, while there's an acknowledgement of a problem, it's usually manifesting in a general way. So I've heard a lot of financial institutions saying things like we have to digitize and we have mandates for data. Uh, and, and the challenge with that high level problem statement is that it could mean anything. It could be about marketing opportunities. It could be about deposits. It could be about lending. And if there's not a specific use case defined, then there really isn't a viable solution. Boss Insights was guilty of this actually in 2019 ourselves. We'd say, we're gonna solve lending everywhere. That's not a use case. PPP lending is a use case. Traditional solutions with accounting is a use case. So that's, that's what I would challenge the industry to do, to just get really specific about what you want solved so that, that we can then come in and say, we've solved this and here's how we can show it. Yeah, great. Will, what's your take on what's working and not working? Yeah, I think um, working for me, my, my sentiments are pretty similar to Karen. Um, I think what I see working is that there's really an acknowledgement about the experience layer matter mattering. And I think that what I'm seeing and hearing, you know, bank executives talk about in every single conversation is make it easy, make it smooth, make it elegant and smooth, elegant and easy. Those are the new hard. And so I think there's still reliance on all these uh, back end legacy technologies and really easy is the new hard convenience is the new loyalty. All of these kinds of things are really just demonstrating that banks are officially now paying attention to the experience that they're providing, not only to their internal team members and the way that they run through the processes that they run through, which are critical for a bank and a bank's efficiency, but they're also really spending time thinking about whether it's the borrower and the borrower journey, uh, whether it's the account holder, the account holder journey, whether it's a business a commercial customer and how they're actually experiencing that brand of the bank, that is now permanent. That is a critical part of every conversation that the experience layer uh, really matters. Um, you know, what's, what's not working and the thing that just continues, um, I think, to be, you know, a little bit of a nagging issue out there, and I guess this will align with what Karen said, is just this concept of data. Just give me the data. I want all the data's let me see all the data and let me make them, you know, amazing. Let, let me help change my bank. And I think that with just the premium on data talent, that it's far better to be subscribing to data solutions and data talent than trying to build out those teams yourselves. I just think that that's really an unsustainable model that financial institutions continue to run down and run towards, you know, that they can essentially create uh, the same kind of talent pool that you might have at, you know, Ohio State University or on the campus of Virginia Tech or at Arizona State University. I mean, it's like you just can't bring these people together to really solve these violent and, and crazy data challenges um, 
in in all of these uh, fragmented markets around the country. There's just simply a not a, there's not enough talent density. So I think actually, you know, considering using other people to help you solve those vexing data problems, I really believe that that is going to have to be a realization because that's not working right now. Everyone wants to build their own data team. Yeah. Hey, Sam, I'm going to get you in the conversation in one second, but I want to just pose one other question for Will and Karen on, on that, on your point, Will. Do you see the uh, organizations, financial institutions, banks and credit unions, having a chief data officer make a difference in the problem? Will, why don't you go first, then Karen, I'll ask you that same question. You know, I think it's a little too early to tell. And, and so I, I'm not, I really am not trying to paint it as if it's a bad thing. I'm just not sure you're going to get the returns that, that you believe you're going to get by, you know, attempting to build out that entire infrastructure yourself. Um, and, and again, it's just based on, uh, uh, you know, statistics. It's just based on talent density. Um, you know, there's a reason why we're moving compute to the cloud because, you know, that's where the, the talent is and the density of the servers uh, and the compute power. I do think it's the same thing with data is that it is coalescing around these really interesting companies that are great to work for, that have a lot of upside. And I think the really talented people aren't necessarily seeking to go to financial institutions, at, at least in the current state. So I think it's too early to tell whether a chief data officer can actually move the needle at a financial institution. I think as long as they're acknowledging that they need to have outside partnerships with rich, uh, young, uh, new, growing companies, uh, I think that's an important realization and that can make a difference. Yeah, Karen, what's your thoughts on that? I'm gonna be really annoying and say I agree with Will again, um, but what I would do is, is just sort of qualify it a little bit. A chief data officer is going to make use of the data. Uh, 2019, Boston Sites was in the UK. We were one of five companies selected to go on a trade mission. And we were sitting in the audience and there were incumbent banks and challenger banks. This in an economy that already has open banking far further down the road than we've gotten here in North America. And a question came from the audience saying, hey, incumbent banks, why don't you just use your data and crush the challenger banks? You have it all. And the thing is, this, this statement of data being the new oil, you can't do much with raw data. You have to actually cook it a little bit, right? A financial statement is not an approved loan. That service coverage could be, but only when compared to other products. So it's insights that are the oil. And the, the part that would be great in terms of partnership is getting data aggregators to provide the source and then having internal data strategy people look at creating machine learning models. That, that would be a great partnership between the internal and the external because they're completely different skill sets. I was sitting in that audience and I just wanted to scream, Mr. Clean over here, we can scrub that for you. And we're still nowhere ahead, even after COVID. What we've solved is very, very minute challenges to move the dial forward, but we're still stuck on, there's a lot of information internal at banks and customers and employees are not getting the benefit of it because we haven't sorted that out. Yeah, yeah. So well, you'd never know reading the, uh, the, the press and the glowing reviews of how machine learning has transformed. Well, Sam, and, and, go ahead, and, jump in there. No, no, I was just gonna say to, uh, to Karen's point, I mean, I think if there's one area where I think there's been some progress, you asked, you know, Ron, the, the question was almost premised on the idea that they have a chief data officer. I was, oh, I was actually asking whether or not the presence uh, of a chief data officer made a made a difference. The, I was wondering if these guys had seen, yeah. you know, institutions well, with a, a chief data officer being a benefit. And I, I think that's actually one thing that's improved is that there actually are some of these characters, in the house, um, and there weren't before. Uh, I was at an event four years ago where there was a level chart that was being populated in real time. The question was, who's the chief data officer in your bank? CFO, CEO, et cetera. And uh, somebody wrote in Dog, and Dog was one of the top responses. There's just nobody there. Uh, so at least there are some people now that I see resources in strategic plans. Yeah, cool. Uh, Tim, you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just, you know, one thing I wanted to just kind of ask about as we asked about what, what's working and what's not working. Um, but kind of to something that you brought up, uh, Karen, around, I think you said faster decisions. You know, people are, they're not just showing up and kicking the tires, which kind of gets into 
kind of how they're buying, I guess, but also just what are they buying right now? I mean, what what's hot? Like, you know, not just what's working and not working, but what are they buying? And is that any different um, uh, in what they bought in 19 or 18 that you're seeing? Yeah, I, I see huge changes. So so really quickly, when, when we're in discussions with banks and credit unions and private lenders, we have to get down to brass tacks. We have all of these exciting conversations about innovation and, and the stars and the moon and the sky and people bring up Yelp reviews and whatnot. But what they're buying is access to accounting information that is verified by accountants if they're running traditional lending models. What they're buying as if they're an alternative lender, real-time payments information. And the reason they would choose us over others is because we have the flexibility for both models. It, it's not, you know, so really we're in the digital transformation bucket, which sounds a lot like innovation, but one is the stars, the moon, the sky. We want to have real-time credit decisioning and we're going to change our decisions. Well, there's no credit risk officer that is excited to go and fix the regulatory model right now. People are a little bit exhausted just making sure that the machine is still running. They just want to make it easier so that the very expensive talent that they're hiring to be relationship managers are focusing on relationship management. I wish that they had that when I was a banker. I spent most of my time doing that manually. Yeah, that was I, I, I was there with you in the <laughs> trenches. Well, well, what are you seeing? What are they buying right now? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we, we're seeing a lot of traction around, you know, this convergence of uh, the requirements for the commercial banker, the person with the sales quota to not just focus on the, the credit uh, sales, but also focus on selling the treasury services. Um, and so what we're seeing is this real, uh, I think, convergence of those two functions within the bank. And I, start, I think you're starting to see this uh, jack of all trades, you know, or, or maybe it's the birth of uh, the true relationship manager, the one that is essentially responsible for attaching all of those products and services um, to these critical commercial customers where, you know, 90% of the profitability, you know, in the bank is actually driven. And so I think what we're seeing people buy is a question on how they use technology to facilitate that journey and those conversations with those critical accounts. You know, what we really believe is that data, where data will be valuable, is not just the data, but the insights. And we actually think those insights turn into coaching. Because what's about to happen as everyone continues to work remote is we're going to need to make sure that the right data is in the right relationship bankers' hands at the right time so that they do not lose credibility with those critical commercial customers. And the way that they lose credibility is by leaving that meeting without actually getting down to the brass tacks of the deal. And so if they have to leave and go back and talk to the used car manager and then return two weeks later, they will have lost the deal. So they must be in a position with the right data, with the right requirements to actually have a meaningful conversation with that person and coordinate that with the treasury services. Cause that's where the profitability will actually be driven on both sides of that balance sheet. What's well, interesting that you mentioned you, it's interesting you mentioned treasury because I think we had this on the last fintech hustle too, Ron. This is this topic keeps coming back up of all these of all the consumer-based topics, and yet commercials hot. So many of the banks I see that are focused on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's so much. The, the thing is, because we were all bankers, right? So it did not matter how thorough you got with a business plan when you went and bought in the specialist. You guys hear the echo? I yeah, know. I think we I think we've got a new Jimi Hendrix filter turned on uh, for some reason there. So I'll ask our administrators, uh, 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 Michelle, if there's a way you can kind of look into that a little bit. But I'll just uh, grab headsets in the meantime. But what we would we would be out there and we'd be commercial bankers and selling to to businesses and then oh it's gone okay and then as we were selling to businesses we bring product specialists. And the product specialist would repeat the conversation. It did not matter how much you prepared that product specialist, they'd have to repeat the conversation. The commercial account manager is cringing in their chair because you know the business owner hates that. Why can't we present them with information? The same thing with, with the financials. Or they're always looked at for lending, but we're dying for partners who will convince the banks that this can be a cross-selling opportunity. So what Q2 is doing is incredible. 
the banks do not right now have the mandate to do that themselves. They're relying on human capital for it. And technology could solve a lot of it. Well, you know, you mentioned, Will, there, I, I thought it was interesting that you started off by saying you see the organizations coming together. So, you know, the target for treasury and the target for lending are increasingly now under the same, whether it's chief banking officer or whatever, but that, the, yes, that technology can help solve some of these things, but that the impetus to your point about human capital, uh, Karen, the impetus started with, we had organizational funk and misalignment. And now we have more banks uh, where they're organizing themselves around customer segments or industry niches or something where you have the lending need and the payments or treasury need aligned with some of the same people so that you don't at least have lots of people chase. I mean, you mentioned earlier, Karen, about use cases. I think what's worse is if if you don't have the same people, if you've got 15 different people chasing fragmented use cases, that's way less interesting than you. If you have somebody with power, and Sam, saying, I got three big ones, you know? Well, yeah. And Sam, I, I think the challenge is that you can't have enough meetings. You can't run enough cycles with those people. So there's not time to call every specialist within the bank to go out and have those conversations because time you know, is a premium today, not only for these commercial customers, but also for the bankers, because they're having to get on a Zoom, they're having to run this session, maybe they meet in person, but the dynamic has just really changed. And so I think what they're starting to see is how fast can you do things and how efficiently can you do those things? Because that's really where relationships are built today. How fast are you at doing it? How efficient and how intelligent are you in that conversation? And you must have the whole relationship data available to you at that time of that conversation. You just have to, you can't, you can't play the, the used car salesperson uh, game anymore. It's just simply not acceptable in financial services. And so I think you're going to see this convergence continue to happen. And I think it's going to change the, the balance sheet of these banks. That's, that's what we believe. So that's, so um, that's what they're buying. Yeah. What are they? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Karen. I was just going to say there's some really quick, easy wins. When, when companies have 20 people, they need group solutions. So if you're connected to their HR, you know that in advance. And then, and, and the thing is a data provider gives that, a workflow organizer presents it to the team, whoever needs to see it. So that puts the bank in the position to, for the first time, proactively approach businesses. They're not waiting. You know, what banks are doing right now is looking at the bank statements to see if if the customer is using a product and then they try and outsell the competition. But what I think Will and I are violently agreeing to is that you should be knowing this in advance and saying, I have the solution to your problems. I am, I am your mm -hmm. financial therapist. I will fix it all. And that's when you get loyalty. That's when you get the full share of the wallet. So I'm getting on a financial story. therapist. Yeah. I think, I think financial therapists, that's one of our first hashtags that you, you when you said that you reminded me, James Robert Lay calls it, you know, be their Yoda. So <laughs> I think, I think you're in the that's right way ballpark better. there. In the, that's way better. Well, you know, lots of ideas, but Ron, were you going to add something there? Yeah, thanks. You know, I'm certainly not out in the field like Will and Karen are trying to sell things, but uh, we're halfway through the data collection for our annual what's going on in banking survey that looks at what the banks and credit unions say they're gonna be buying. And for like the uh, 132nd year in a row, digital account opening is, is at the top of the list once again, and which continues to amaze me that A, why haven't you guys got this done yet? Not you guys being Will and Karen, but the, the banks and credit unions. Uh, but also interesting thing I kind of uh, sort of calculated here is that according to the most recent survey results that we're, that we're getting, if the banks and credit unions who said that they have already um, in the past three years uh, uh, deployed a new digital account opening system and add the ones who say they're gonna do it in 2021, 20, basically half the industry will have implemented or replaced the DAO in the, the past three to four years, which uh, means that at some point in time, you know, maybe by the 135th year of our survey, uh, that number is going to start going down. But, you know, the reason I bring this up is that to me, it means that they're not buying other things that could, you know, really, I think, move the needle in the business. I, you know, I still argue that, uh, 
I'm not convinced that just putting in digital account opening adds new business. I think people are already making decisions to do business with that bank or credit union, and you may lose some, but I, I'm just afraid they're, they're not really going after some, you know, bigger long-term issues with, with their, um, with their technology buying. I'm just, I'm just, yeah, Ron. impressed. Sorry about that. I just want to say, Ron, I'm impressed that we have research that goes all the way back to the Ulysses S. Grant administration. That's my <laughs> contribution for today. So sorry about that. Will, you were going to say something actual value? <laughs> no, I, I was just going to, I was just going to pile on. I mean, it, it does feel like, uh, I mean, if you're asking, th there is a, a big push towards this. Uh, it feels like because of the moment that we are in, that this is a run the bank initiative, that you need to be able to run new accounts, you know, digitally and online. I think what happens when you start talking about online account opening is there's a lot of stakeholders that come into this. Um, and it just seems that it can, it can turn into this very, very complex decision when we should really just be focusing on the experience, smoothing that experience out and allowing that access. So, yeah, Ron, I agree with you. I think it's been interesting that it continues to be the number one thing that people talk about. And while I, I think it's absolutely important, I think you just, um, it's, it's one of those projects that, that everyone gets involved in. Everyone has an opinion on that one. Um, we all know what everyone says about opinions. So, um, you know, I, I just think that um, it, it, it should be, they should be thinking about it more as a run the bank. It's an absolute requirement. You know, we at you know, Q2 believe that you can't have digital banking without having it. It's part of the new definition of that service because digital actually is banking. So I, I think it's it's one of those things that's an absolute requirement. You have to stop separating it out and allowing it to be this one little feature purchase. We should be purchasing it when we think about the whole journey for those customers. It's not a channel. It's the thing, right? It's the thing. That's right. So that's so that's what's so that's what they're buying. Um, and yeah, we've had some good violent agreements there. I appreciate you mentioning that, Karen. So let's try for some, maybe not violent disagreements, but let's try for some disagreements. Sure. Uh, what's not, what are they not buying right now? Is there, you know, what is, what is not happening right now in terms of maybe things they were buying in 19 or ways they were buying in 19? What, what's, what's not happening? What's not being bought? What I would say, it's not so much about 19 versus 20, it's about controlling the conversation. What I was going to say about the, the last discussion is, I'm sure Will has been there, I've been there, where you get into, uh, so let's talk about account opening. Boston Insights was actually in the running this year for account opening, we're data for lending software. And I think that's the biggest thing that's not working. They're, they're interviewing a lot of different technology vendors for the same job rather than taking the expert in the one space. And so when you get into digital account opening and you go through the flow charts, somewhere on there, whether it's posted or if it's done by electronics, there's this is Sarah's job or this is Will's job or, you know, and that person goes on vacation or gets promoted and the whole thing breaks down. So there is digitization and transformation, but there's also a lot of manual and those, those, that's what's not working. When we're in sales conversations, just as often as people are asking us about QuickBooks and Xero and FreshBooks and Sage, they're asking us about Yelp reviews. What, what's not working is the constant discussion about things that are light years away versus focusing on the here and now. How do we, you know, the, the industry, and, and that's, that speaks for all of us, right? It has, we're in a moment of crisis. There are sexier industries to be in. So if we're going to attract talent, we have to give them an excellent experience. I don't know, I was a banker from 2010 to 2014. I don't know that the bankers of today wanted to go through what we had to go through back then. It must seem like, you know, you're, you're just operating without any kind of automation whatsoever. What we do is really try and focus the conversation away from, let's take user reviews as a way to lend or as a way to get treasury service and let's talk brass tacks. Show me your flow chart that you're actually working with. Let's identify where there's a human involved and let's fix that piece for you. And let's see the result and then we'll go to the next piece. That's Show me your flow chart. Yeah. Uh, hey, Will, what's not, uh, you know, what are they not buying? Um, yeah, I mean, just thinking about things that, that don't, um, 
I mean, I don't really know if there's one area that I would say that they aren't buying, Sam. I mean, it feels to me like there's a lot of push to to transform the bank. And I think they're looking at smoothing everything. I mean, when I talk to banks on, on a regular, um, you know, really cadence, I mean, I probably talk to at least one a day, if, if not more. Um, I'm, I'm seeing them have these kind of middle and back office initiatives, and I'm seeing them have these you know, front uh, user or account holder facing experiences. And I'm sort of feeling like they're learning to bifurcate those uh, strategic initiatives and work through them. And so, you know, I see people asking questions really around that kind of three, 360 degree view of the bank. And I think they're trying to make all areas of uh, their digital brand better. Um, so I don't, I don't really know that I could go point to one thing that they are no longer focused on. I think the big idea that I'm starting to see people is they are starting to marry in their head account opening with doing digital lending inside the app with making sure that they have a way to do surveys of their account holders and do net promoter scores so they can actually get their bonus. So I'm seeing them ask for this myriad of services to be brought together in a very smooth and elegant way. And it feels like that's trumping what they're not buying. It feels like they're not buying in silos as much and they're trying to buy the experience more. That's my feeling. It could also be, as I think about it, it could also be a, a reflection of, of what you all offer too, right? Meaning, you know, whether it's data, Karen, or whether it's uh, the fact that, you know, Q2 is predominantly a digital company. I mean, it's not like you're sitting there having, you know, deep conversations with them about their branch lockboxes or, you know, anything that's heavily kind of a headwind on physical right? I mean, you guys are heavy digital, so you might not be running across those things. That's a pretty good problem. Um, but, um, anyway, yeah, very but Sam, but Sam, I am, I, we are hearing, you know, from these folks about the, you know, the new popcorn machines and the new coffee machines for the lobbies, you know, they want those to be automated as well. I'm, I'm kidding. Of course. I'm like, I mean, they're, well, I'm they're, like I, that's a new technology for me, man. I gotta get one of those. <laughs> I, I thought he was serious. Yeah, we hear a lot about, do we want to have an all-in-one solution or do we want best in class? So one is they want to stitch together and put their unique stamp on a couple different solution providers externally. And the other one is they either want to build it themselves or get somebody who can do everything all in one. And the, the buying decisions go quite differently, whether they're doing one or the other. I don't know if you're seeing that, Will. Oh, sorry, I know you just went on mute. <laughs> No, that's okay. I'm, I'm muting things back and forth. I mean, I, I really do. I, I think, you know, one of the things that we're starting to see is that people, yes, they are wanting to build their own innovation pods and uh, do some of this building on their own. And I think what they're expecting is to work in uh, a manner in which they would work like with Salesforce or with Microsoft, you know, app dynamics to where they can actually go and kind of participate, you know, in something where uh, a lot of the complexity has been removed. And, you know, so at, at Q2, you know, we've had a way to extend our platform for a long time, but now we've, we've kind of minted this concept of an innovation studio. And so we, we now have our, our customers working on this, and we now have our partners, third-party system integrators, that are now starting to do the innovation for the financial institutions. And so one of the big things that I see just around who's buying, who's building, who's making the decision is that speed, you know, speed kills. I mean, that's kind of a, a quote from, you know, back when I, I used to play football, which was 100 years ago, and I also wasn't very good at it because uh, I was not fast, but speed kills. And I think now what we're really seeing from the vast majority of financial institutions is they want to be able to move, they want to be able to move at their own pace, and they're willing to work with a broader ecosystem than they ever were before. And so we're really trying to focus on how we can enable that innovation to actually come from the financial institutions uh, themselves and, and work with third parties and work with Q2. So it's just kind of a, a opening up and it's acknowledgement that there are talented people everywhere, despite what I sort of said before around the data talent kind of being, you know, centered in certain areas, but there's talented people everywhere in financial services and they want to move when they want to move. And so we're just trying to make that an opportunity for them. Hey, so I was going to jump in with a question for you, Will, on um, who I should start in my fantasy football league this week because I'm getting my <laughs> ass kicked by my wife and three daughters and son-in-law. But now that you said you weren't any good at it, screw it, I'm going to go to a different direction. And you know, I want to get both everybody's perspective on something. You know, uh, when the pandemic hit this year, a couple of months, you months know, after the real uh, bottom of it, I guess, 
you know, a lot of the press was talking about how digital transformation was accelerating. And, you know, I still argue with that a bit. I think what we really saw was an increase in digital adoption, not necessarily digital transformation. But, you know, I want to kind of take this up, not just so who's buying what and what's working, not working, but, you know, where do you see your, your clients, where are they at in terms of digital transformation uh, of their institutions? And, and how are you fitting into those plans? Karen, you want to go first on that one? Yeah, I, I think the answer is somewhere in the middle. I, I'm hearing from heads of innovation that actually have budgets. So that is a argument under the transformation column. But the solutions that we're adopting are, we're not touching the credit model. That, that's the biggest misconception that you can, you can get 80% faster decisioning and servicing and keep everything the same. So that's just adoption. Right. It's it's when we're presenting debt service coverage, people call it AI and all it is is just calculations. Right. So so we're I mean, in the theme of what Will was saying, we're we're not quarterbacking transformation. We're quarterbacking adoption. This is the first time I've ever heard a quarterback say not very good at football, but OK. Uh, <laughs> well, <he's laughs> I, humble. Yeah, but 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 really the the right to quarterback the, the reason why i'm saying that we're somewhere in the middle is that if we earn the right to quarterback the adoption then we can audition for the transformation job i think the transformation job is going to open in 2021 2022 when they see that you can trust an outside provider to really get you results it's not just an external expense this is something that's tied to revenues if, if we audition properly, then we, we can then help in collaboration and partnership all together, move the ecosystem forward. Will, wanna jump in on that? Just gotta click off that mute button you got on there. There you go. Yeah, violent, violent disagreement on that one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, I agree again. I, I, do, I do think that, you know, these uh, transformation is accelerating. I, I really do believe that financial institutions are opening up their pocketbooks. They see that this is a requirement. Um, they are, you know, there's a lot of, you know, touchless purchases that are happening now. There's QR codes being used for menus. These are things that, that are real and, and, and all age groups are using them. And so I think what banks are, are beginning to sense is it is the time to smooth out the experience, make force all of these back-end system providers to actually work with the people that can kind of build and, and, and modify this experience layer because they realize it is their brand. The experience is the brand now. There's just, there's no arguing with that. It's not the walnut. It's not the, you know, the giant building. It's not the real estate location. It's not the position. The brand is the experience that they can provide, you know, on a small phone essentially. And, uh, and, and for their employees, their employees want to work with modern technology. So I, I think it's accelerating. I absolutely think it's permanent. And I think the questions that people are asking now um, feel like what we always imagined they would be. And so I'm very, I think we're really at a, great, at a great place. Hey, Sam, you do a lot of strategic planning work with our clients. And you know, where's, where's digital transformation on the agenda? What, what are the barriers they see to how are they defining it and, and how, how fast are they really moving towards something? Well, I think Karen nailed it earlier when she said, you know, let's get specific. I think that's one of the things that's really changed is there was a better than decent chance that they had digital transformation, literally those words, on some document somewhere that meant very little or was incremental. And then all of a sudden, there's no way for you to talk to people. I agree with Will that experience has been really focused on for quite some time, I would say, but I think it was mainly focused on in the transactional and servicing elements of running a bank. Um, the How a customer finds you, shops you, decides on you, buys from you, originates with you, um, those elements, the front part of the process have been a mess. They've been a mess for years. Uh, they're still a mess. Um, as you pointed out, Ron, digital account opening, uh, people are on Rev 2, Rev 3, Rev 4. They might have four or five different ones in there at Rev 4. And so uh, I think the main thing is they're, they're trying to get very, very specific. How do we measure this? How do we know when we're there? How do we know if we failed so we could stop and try something else? And um, I mean, I, I just have to say, though, I, I'm 
I'm really sold well on that real-time integrated coffee maker and popcorn machine. I, that's that's something I got to get my hand. See, to me, that's really digital transformation. If you can get the popcorn and the coffee figured out, I think you, you're you're there. But will there be uh, foam? That's what's what that? Wondering. Will there be foam? Well, but you're right. Is it is it the coffee that has the the crema on the top versus <laughs> just the standard you know gas station coffee? But I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's what I'm you know seeing right. I don't know if that's kind of what you're looking for. I just think it's much more specific now because it's more urgent. Yeah, and Ron, I think I think when when you know just hearing Sam say that, I think the specificity is in, is critical. I think what people are doing, however, when they talk about the specific change in the experience, is they are threading that to to the next action that people need to take. So you can onboard, but after you onboard, you have to engage, which means you have to make sure you get your debit card and you need to make sure you move your direct deposit over and you need to set up bill pay. And then you need to be able to, uh, those same people need to be able to get a credit product from you. And so what they're no longer saying is help me get someone into digital banking. They're now saying, get them in now engage with them. They're saying, don't just advertise to someone so that they know that they could open an account with me, but help them go from learning about me to adding the account to living in digital banking, to getting a loan, to activating their debit card. They're asking those those journey questions, the journeys are starting to come. So while they're talking about the specific, there's always someone in the room that wants to make it about the journey because banking is a journey. That, that, that is the definition of banking. You use different parts depending on where you are in your journey. And so I see it being very specific, but it's always trying to thread to the journey of what it means to have a banking relationship. Well, I, I would say that the consumer has experienced a huge uplift on experience on their on their journey, but the business, no, the business still lives like it's 1995. I there's no tie from when money is coming in to if a if a business is experiencing revenue to when they have to make payments. Everything is an individualized experience. Everything takes time. If you're doing anything outside of the norm. Let's say you're sending an international wire, you're in the branch even during COVID. It doesn't make any kind of sense. And I, and I think that's probably the next bucket that needs to be addressed because the SMBs are the backbone of the economy. We have to be able to serve them. Their top three need is lending. And as Will said a lot earlier, that's not going to be the money maker for the bank, especially not with the interest rates where they are now. But if you want the right to serve that customer, you need to solve their lending needs and then you need to give them a great journey when it comes to cash management, transactional payments, stop having them become the expert in your products and meet the customer where they are. Just give them what they need when they need it. I, I say this as someone selling a bank, someone who used to work at a bank and now someone who's a business customer myself. You know, I don't want to sound like I'm disagreeing here, but I always tend to do that. But here's the thing that just sort of <laughs> comes to mind is that whether it's a small business or a consumer, I don't think even as a consumer myself, I don't ever think of what I'm doing as a journey. That doesn't even sound like a good thing to do. I just want it to be done. Whatever I want, I want it done. I want it done fast. And damn it, I want it done right. And, and I'm thankful that I, my wife handles a lot of our banking needs and has the patience to deal with these people because it's not, it's just not right. But that's, we don't, you know, I don't think consumers, whether a you know, customer, whether it's a consumer or a small business, thinks of this as a journey. And that's, I don't know, that just keeps coming to mind as the challenge that the banks have to kind of get over here as they keep talking about this thing as journeys. No, I, I, I mean, thank you for grounding me. I'm sorry that that's an internal term that I guess is speak no, that, that we use around thing. here. Use it all the time. But Ron, but Ron, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think, um, and, and maybe I should qualify that just a tiny bit. You know, when we, I guess we think about the journey and the reason why we like to talk in journeys is because people come and they bring their own context with them. And if you imagine context are the suitcases for the journey, people approach their bank and $100 means very different things. To, to people that, that are actually showing up at a bank. And so I think when, when we talk about journeys, it's making sure that the right services are available for the right person at the right term, where they are with the context that they bring. And so maybe journey is the wrong word, but no, um, no, I, no. I think it's just- I, I, I think it's, pr it's productive, Will. It's productive. I mean, yeah, to the customer journeys like what an 80s band, right? Don't stop believing. 
But it, <laughs> what I what I love about it is at least you're inside. So for years and years, when you talked to bankers, or even in many cases, fintech partners, they were talking about process inside the bank. Start with compliance, work your way forward. I mean, let's face it, compliance had the power. You move yourself forward to the lending department, maybe docs first and then lending. And then maybe at some point you actually talk about the application and how it affects the, the consumer. At least the processes that people are looking at now are starting with consumers and businesses. That's a step in the right direction. It's uh, so true, Sam. I, I, I really, I'm stuck on this point ever since we started talking with payment, payment processors. Why are we not tying when money's coming in for a business to when they have to make expenses? A lot of those expenses are regular. Why don't they just show up on the screen right away? Here's a wonderful journey or a get me back to my life. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm a business. Money's come into your account internally without the, the business even being aware of it. The expense could pop up and you hit a button. Mm -hmm. Why are those two separate experiences for the business instead of being one experience? On the back end, I'm sure Will and I could get together and figure that out very quickly. Why, why isn't it that way? Why isn't that a priority for financial institutions right now? Because I will tell you that it is certainly a priority for the visas and Amexes of the world. So. Yeah, that's a, I, actually it's funny. I had, had a question come in that kind of ties this together. I just wanted to run by you guys because we were talking both about data and then also the, you know, the kind of reaching out to the, to the consumer and the consumer journey. But the question was really about have we gotten to a point where when it, when it comes to the data, whether it's, you know, data that's helping them budget or, or whatever, you know, their name and address, I mean, not name and address, but like, you know, if something's changed, like an address change, can customers change their own information? You know, uh, meaning can we turn data management and data science into also an element where consumers can make some of their own changes and correct errors without having to necessarily have the banker do that work? I don't know if either one of you guys, maybe that's just very tactical, but I thought it was a good question. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, we, yes. Uh, consumers and businesses can change their own data. I mean, if they move locations, they can make those changes. If they want to change a mailing address or a phone number, those are just high risk activities today because that's how a lot of alerts are pushed out and that's where a lot of statements are done. So it's just really important that there's a risk and a fraud, uh, you know, monitoring of when uh, key personal information is actually changed. Um, and then the next question comes is, can you actually go and update that on the core, you know, in real time? And so that's just a matter of the adapters. Um, so yes, Sam, we're, we're already, people are already allowing for that. And Karen, sounds like I need to go on some sales calls or somebody needs to go on some sales calls with you because we do all the things you say you can't do uh, for the commercial bank, but, but I'm not going to get into any of that right now. I didn't say we couldn't do it. I'm saying that they don't buy it. Going back to the question of will they buy it? They, they're all aware it's possible. This technology has been possible for years. That's not where they're spending their dollars, right? Hey, one thing I wanted to ask about is we talked a little bit earlier about you know, what's working and not, not working or not selling and you know, or what, the, what are they buying and not buying. And I just wanted to ask, Will, I know you, but I know Karen, you, you know the ecosystem well, you talked about it, but just, Will, I know you guys have worked with a lot of different in addition to banks and credit unions, you've worked with a lot of, you know, the startup fintechs and, you know, kind of interesting um, startup brands and things like that. I was just going to ask, what do you, what do you see that's working or not working in partnerships? You know, everybody talks about partners. Yeah. They're not in many, most of the time we use the terms of partner, it's not even partner, but in, in true situations where it is a partnership and you're working with a third party or other fintech companies out there and how, what's working there and what's not? Yeah, so um, yeah, there's a lot of those really interesting relationships out there. I, I would say what is working uh, in those partnerships or what's working for those fintechs is really going and attacking, you know, a, a very specific use case. This goes back to the point that you were making earlier. They find something that they can do really, really well and they go and they do it. I also think the the amazing thing that happens in those partnerships is is when you know the the financial institution says you can't do it that way, and I think what we sense you know from uh, the fintechs that we work with is just a lot of why not, and yes we can, and you know we can do graduated AML, graduated KYC. So if someone wants to put ten dollars in an account, we'll let them put ten bucks in that account. If they want to put two hundred thousand in an account, 
you know, we're going to start paying attention and actually have them go through a more rigorous process around identity and identity management and um, verification. So I, I think what I'm starting to see is what works well is, um, you know, the pushback that you get from fintechs around how they can push the envelope. That's one. And then the other part that's working well is the infrastructure that a bank provides and the compliancy that they actually uh, allow these fintechs to benefit from. I do think that the, the fintechs are, are respecting that. And I think there's now a, a more mutual respect than there ever has been in the past. And, and, you know, as much as the fintech is talking about disrupting the bank and banks are terrible and banks are bad, I think they realize that there's a specific role that they can play in helping them launch this niche service that they want to go offer. And I think they find that partnership comforting. Karen, anything, would you, would you agree, anything, agree, disagree, or any other observations on what's going on in partnerships and what's working or not? Well, that last sentence was everything. You want to go launch a product if, in a bank, that's going to be a very expensive endeavor. And for a fintech, you can just do it very quickly and you can test it before investing millions. What's working well is when companies, whether they're a bank or fintech or whatnot, realize that the, the opportunity is in the platform play. The ultimate example of the platform play is Amazon. They once sold their own product and it was books. And I don't think anyone thinks of Amazon as a books company anymore. What they're selling is the opportunity for selling. So that is the super highway right now. And it's not a surprise they're going into lending. There are, there's a divide in financial institutions between the ones that are holding on to their financial products of the day and making sure they're as competitive as possible and the ones that are opening up their systems to work with the best in class fintech and offer new products that others can't. So fast forward five years from now, who, who will be in a better position to compete in the market, which is very busy. There's a lot of fintech, there are a lot of banks, there are a lot of uh, tech companies that are entering. And, and so who's going to be in a better position? And I would argue it's the companies that consider that the platform is the ideal. With opening it up, you're going to get to the best offerings. You know, the customer actually has the seat at the table. They're deciding. There was a question earlier on how do you protect the customer and their data? Of course, they're giving permission. They should be giving permission, right? It, the, the idea that you could create an ecosystem that challenges all of us to bring our best every day, that's how we'll win. That's how we compete, by collaborating. Hey, so we've only got a couple more minutes and I know people are going to be uh, bailing out just a couple minutes before the top of the hour. So uh, I, I just want to get in there with sort of our last topic and get everybody's uh, points and opinions on a very specific question. Um, predictions for, for 2021 and I'll abstain since I've already published my predictions for 2021 and people I hope will check it out at the FinTech Snark Tank on Forbes. Okay, there's my little pitch for the day. And uh, so predictions for, for 2021, Will? Uh, predictions for 2021. Um, I actually think that you're gonna continue to see this uh, focus on uh, the commercial side of the bank. I think you're also gonna continue to see a focus on the digitization automa automation uh, of lending. And I think people are gonna wanna be able to make faster decisions there. I think data is gonna continue to rise in its importance the question is, how are insights actually going to be shared across the organization? And so I really think that one of the huge, you know, emerging uh, trends is going to be this concept of an enterprise coach that actually coaches change throughout the organization. And so those, those are a couple things that I, that I personally believe are going, are going to happen uh, in 2021. Great. Karen, your predictions for 2021? Jumping onto that bandwagon, I would just say that we're going to use data, we're going to use insights, and we're going to use it to meet customers where they are. We're going to stop asking them to be experts in financial services, and we're going to meet them wherever they are. We're not going to tell them what accounting software to use or what payment platform. We're just going to accept whatever it is that they want and then hit them up with the product that is most useful for them. It'll allow us to move as an industry from reacting to what they're doing to being proactive. And then the other trend I see is that we're not just going to focus on customer experience. We're really going to put an underline on employee experience. That's going to become increasingly important. Excellent. Sam, what are your predictions for the coming year? I think, I think mergers and acquisitions are going to pick back up and be hotter. Um, you know, there's been a little bit of, a, of an easing here during the year for all the obvious reasons. Uh, there have been some activity, obviously, but I, I just think that there's going to be um, and I think it's it's predominantly to 
redirect physical spend into digital spend. And one way to do that without a lot of controversy and a lot of internal organizational heartburn is through a merger. It's amazing what you can accomplish when you just put it all in the middle of an acquisition expense. So that'd be my prediction. Excellent. Well, listen, uh, Will, Karen, uh, Sam, and for behalf of uh, Cornerstone and, and Sam and I want to thank you guys for taking the time out this afternoon to join us on FinTech Hustle. Uh, for everybody on the line, thank you for joining us. To the person who submitted question number two that didn't get addressed, Sam and I will check that out and get back to you on that. And uh, so listen, uh, I want everybody to have a, a great holiday season, a great New Year's, and uh, hope to see you back in January when we have the next uh, episode of the uh, FinTech Hustle. And uh, we're, what's Sam, throw it, show it up to the camera, Sam, what do you got there? It's the Ben, it's the ben Crosby record. Get yeah, it out, excellent. folks. Get out your old records. All right. Thanks a lot, folks. Have a great holiday. We'll see you in January.